And now I handle the... Thank you, Steffi. And uh, let's give a very warm welcome to Sky Hopinka and let's go on stage. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Now, we often say that uh, there are patterns that connect, and it's fascinating. Uh, Sheffi, as every year, invited me to, to curate a, a, a section with uh, emerging artists. Uh, I always visit many studios all year long, and uh, I suddenly realized, actually, throughout uh, 2019, really, that so many artists I visited would also be poets. And you saw earlier today, uh, of course, the conversation uh, with Tao Lewis at the very beginning of the day. We're going to have Julien Creuset a little bit later, and now Sky Hupinka. And they are all artists and also poets. So what we need for the 21st century now is not only art, but also poetry. One thing which is also important, I think, in relation to um, Steffi's theme, what to add. I mean, Edouard Glissant, the great writer from Martinique, uh, always said that we live in an age of homogenized globalization, and that um, makes uh, or causes many things to disappear. Uh, Elizabeth Colbert talks about the six masters function. Rifkin has just been talking about that. But also cultural phenomena disappear. Languages disappear. And then, of course, Christian described as well the counter-reaction to globalization, uh, new forms of nationalism, uh, new forms, uh, basically, of refusal of uh, solidarity and dialogue. And he said we need to resist it both. We need to resist the homogenized globalization and we need to resist this localist counter-reaction and find a way what he called mondialité, a global dialogue. And as part of that, of course, to listen and to also avoid, you know, that things disappear. And this disappearance of languages, I mean, languages disappear faster than ever before, is a very important part of uh, Sky Hopinka's work. And uh, I understand that you are a member of the Ho Chunk Nation, descendant of the Pechanga Band of Luiseno. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit uh, how this feeds into your practice, and which narratives you want to share with us today. Yeah, um, it fits into my practice in, in huge ways. One, just this identity of who I have been for my entire life, being a, an American Indian, a Native American, and an indigenous person in the United States. Um, it's always shaped how I view the world, and being able to be a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation and a descendant of the Pechanga are different facets of, of my identity, even just with that statement alone, where I'm an enrolled member of the tribe, and I'm also a descendant of another tribe. And so already there's these boundaries and barriers between who I am and how I um, understand the idea of citizenship as well as my own self within these different boundaries and in these different landscapes. And also, language you know, plays such a large role in your work. I read uh, that, in part, that you studied and taught Chinookwawa, a language uh, indigenous, actually, to the lower Columbia River Basin. So I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about that and the relationship to that language. Yeah, so I was living in Portland, Oregon. Well, first, my tribes are located um, 1,000 miles south in Southern California and 2,000 miles to the east in Wisconsin. So in Portland, Oregon, it isn't my home community, but rather it's a community that I moved to. And so as I decided to learn an indigenous language, it made sense to learn the language of the, of the landscape that I was in. And through that process of learning this language, I also participated in the community, and that has also informed my video making practice where I often think about what does it mean to be a guest and a visitor. Even though I'm indigenous, doesn't mean I'm indigenous to all these different places. And so there are different boundaries that I am interested in exploring between these different cultures and how to counteract um, or question what these different boundaries are imposed upon us by the government. Now, um, we had earlier today Tao Lewis talking about language also as a, as a telling us about mm -hmm. the time capsule. Um, we had Lina Atra telling us about this idea also of language as resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, you speak about language as a container of culture. Can you tell us about what you mean with that? Yeah, where there's so many different ways of looking at the world with the language that you speak, and often you notice them or you don't. But primarily growing up speaking a English, um, the process of learning an indigenous language was totally, it totally upended my ideas of language. And where the language that I learned from Chinook and also from my different tribes, they taught me a lot about how the landscape and how the different cultural aspects that are precious uh, exist within the language, or can only be understood in the language. And it's a very, it was a very special thing to, to learn this language and to understand the things that couldn't translate. Where often growing up in the US and 
uh, like foreign language classes, you are taught how things are equivocal or how this means this and this means this, but you're often not taught to explore and embrace the um, intranslatability of certain words and certain ideas. I've been speaking to Arthur Jaffer actually for an exhibition we did at the Serpentine. Um, he shared a quote with me from the artist and filmmaker Namjoon Parekh. Uh, and Namjoon Parekh, uh, relevant here for DLD because he was early involved in experiments with technology also and always said that art can be a kind of a warning system. Pike said the culture that's going to survive in the future is the culture that you can carry around in your head. Would you agree? I would. I would definitely agree, especially as languages shift and cultures shift where the culture of Native Americans 100 years ago is different from the culture 100 years before that. So there's always this evolution and there's always this shifting and the best way to maintain that is how you are involved within it yourself and how you think about it and how you process it. And then of course uh, you started to make films and you brought your writing and visual practice together really in film and I wanted to ask you before we then see uh, a recent film, The Location Blues, I wanted to ask you, tell us how, how you came to film? Um, how film came to you, <laughs> either way? As it was mostly because my friends and I were fairly tired of the state of native cinema in the US and wanted to make films, or just like wanted to make art that wasn't didactic, that wasn't expository, and that wasn't following the same sorts of narratives that we're told we need to follow, i.e. around tragedy, around trauma, around historical romanticization of our pasts, around boarding schools, and around these different things that are very present and a part of our lives, but also trying to look at things that exist beyond that, like what does it mean to be Native? in this country today. And so it was mostly just picking up a camera and fishing, or um, filming my friends and I fishing along the Columbia River and just making a film about friends that are do enacting culture without having to explain culture. And from there, that's, that inspired um, a lot of different works. Now, your films often contain writing also as a kind of a visual device. So it's not only you know, utilitarian to convey information, it's, it's more than that. And maybe before we see a three minute extract actually from this location blues, it would be great to hear a little bit more about, um, about that film, which has a lot to do with, um, of course, the landscape. It has also to do with the Standing Rock uh, demonstrations. It connects very much with the theme of, uh, of ecology. Um, yeah, so, well, the, the film was made when I went to Standing Rock and was there um, in November and December. And really what the film became about was processing the whole experience where, I don't know, like going there with a the camera, I was very aware of the, the power that a camera holds, especially who's pointing the camera. And I didn't want to be complicit in exploiting this event for whatever gains that, I don't know, just like when you're there, you don't want to, I didn't want to film natives getting beaten up. I didn't want to film violence. And really the thing that I wanted to focus on was just how this is an enactment of decolonization. We have tribes gathered en masse in, and I mean, it, that hasn't happened in probably like a hundred years. It's a very, very long time. And to see a group of people come together like that with this 10,000, 15,000 people, there's questions around what values do we hold on to? What values do we let go? How do certain ideas from uh, historical context exist today? And that was really fascinating. That, that was really challenging. It was also became important for me to be a participant as an indigenous person rather than as a filmmaker that happened to be indigenous. So maybe we can see the film now? Yeah, uh, there's a dislocation blues clip. The next Sorry. one? Yeah, the next one. Maybe have the next film, please.
it was like this is where it's supposed to happen at, you know. And show the world. I mean it got done. <laughs> Everybody needs to know about this, you know. There should be more here. All the way over to the river over there. It should be that long of a camp. I feel like there's a bit of nostalgia to it. Maybe I'm wrong, but even just this this like, we evacuated in January, but... But I keep forgetting bad stuff that happened. To... My ability to speak. Like, and I forget that because... Because my time there, and I don't know if... And I, I, I don't know if this is the same, I can only speak for myself, but... My time there is now being sort of cast into this magical, rose-colored nostalgia. But it was like this. I don't know. Do you think that was, like, accurate, the... the... critiques, the criticisms, and the reasons why we wouldn't... we don't... we're reluctant to crit criticize? Can you tell us a little bit more about how the fragment sits in the overall, you know, in the overall film? And I was also interested in this idea, you know, because it's obviously a political work. And Rauschenberg once said the artist's job is to be a witness to his or her or their time in history. Can we say that for this film? Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. Well, I mean, the, this film, the, 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 the section you just watched, it exists um, about two thirds of the way through the film. Um, and it follows those two voices, the one that you don't see, and then Cleo, who's on the laptop screen, um, as they're processing this whole experience. And I really do have to say that that moment when Cleo looks to me and asks, you know, is, is, is that right? You know, does that make sense? Like, the, I don't know, it's like one of my favorite moments in an interview because it just shows, like, how uncertain we are and how uncertain they are in a certain sense of vulnerability in moving through this, where, I don't know, like, while seeing Standing Rock unfold on TV, on the internet, and social media, you have a sense that there's a really strong unified front, and that's important to have a strong unified front, but then also, like, who do you talk to to process the whole thing, to question what happens, to critique it, and to criticize it? And so, for that moment, it, it, was, it was a really special moment that I, I think about often. You brought us also a second film, which we're going to watch now, which is Anti Objects. It's a short extract of two minutes, and that film again, you know, mm -hmm. connects to extinction. It's maybe a moment also to remember Gustav Metzger, the visionary uh, English artist who never insisted, you know, he never stopped insisting really that artists should create works which address the urgent danger society faces. He specifically called upon artists to use their agency to actually. Um, you know, work on the theme of extinction. And uh, he said, we have at the present time a destruction taking place in and of nature, unprecedented in, in history. Uh, he also launched a big movement, which we showed at the Serpentine over many years called Remember Nature. So I was curious about your take on extinction to hear a little bit more about this film, Anti-Objects, before we then watch it. Yeah, with Anti-Objects, it's a film that I made, again, using the Chinookwawa language, rather, it's using these archival recordings of the last speaker in 1983, I believe, um, with the linguist Henry Zenk. And so once Wilson died, he was 83 years old at the time, or I think he was in his 90s, actually. Um, when he died, Henry, by default, became the last speaker of this language. And so the, the language never really reached the level of extinction, but with one speaker left, you can imagine that it's very, very, very close. With the work that Henry's done over the last 20, 30 years with the tribe to revive the language, like, I'm a, I'm a result of that, and the way that I speak the language is from Henry and from the conversations that you'll see in this video. Um, so, I don't know, so while extinction is very present with all these different native languages and tribes around the US and around the world that have been affected by colonialism, there still are movements that are being made and undertaken to try and save these languages and to give 
speakers an opportunity to give the language like another 30, 40 years. So, I mean, like by me learning the language and being a teacher of the language, I've hopefully given the language another 30 years. Knock on wood. Thank you. Let's watch the film. Thank you so much, Sky. A big round of applause. And as I said, you know, in each of these panels, as part of the conversation, we have a poetry reading. I'm very delighted to invite you now to to read a poem. This is uh, So What um, by this native poet. His name's Franklin K. R. Klein. Uh, this is it. So what? I'm trying to avoid this dangerous culture of want. Mercury, it seems, is always in retrograde. It's all getting jumbled. Meanwhile, I'm telling someone, I don't remember if they asked or not, about pastoral poetry. It describes the land without calling it stolen generally speaking, anyway. Why write poems about the lands? It describes itself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we have um, a few minutes left for last questions. I wanted to ask you to answer Steffi's question. What, what do you add? What do I add? I feel like I add or offer or share a different way of looking at one's own place as an indigenous person in this country, to see that there are ways of looking at what you can do outside of what you're told you have to do. And maybe the last question is the only recurrent question in all the conversation about the unrealized projects. As always, you know, I want to know from artists about dreams, projects which have been too big to be realized. We know a lot about architects and realized projects. We don't know about scientists. So poets or visual artists and real life projects, what, what have you not been able to do so far? There's this um, film that I want to make about powwows and native powwows in the United States, and it'll be a feature-length film, and I'm really interested in this powwows as, their, as a form of a resistance that have been taking place for the last hundred years, and how they've changed and adapted, and they're really about survival and creating a new indigenous identity. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Sky Hopinka. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.